Welcome to chapter 11. This chapter focuses on Aboriginal social welfare or Indigenous social welfare and uses the Idle No More movement as an example of collaboration between members of the white settler society and immigrant, other immigrant, people of color, immigrant society, and Indigenous people in Canada. I'd like to issue a warning as I move forward. I am, well, truthfully, a nice, well-intentioned white lady. And there's a real problem with the idea that I would be the person who's delivering a chapter about Indigenous social welfare. So we're going to lean heavily on a number of supplemental materials that will be loaded on Blackboard that take into account the first voice perspective of Indigenous people and shares with you some information about the Idle No More movement. I'd really like to stress the importance of looking at those resources for this chapter because I can only reiterate to you what has been taught to me sometimes by Indigenous people, sometimes by other nice well-intentioned white people like me. And so looking at those materials, when we talk about Indigenous Canadians, sometimes there's a tendency to lump everyone into one category. Aboriginal, Native, First Nations, Indigenous. Ah, it's all pretty much the same. But that's really not true. And so the first distinction that we're going to talk about is a formal definition that divides the categories of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people into three distinct categories. I'm pretty sure that you can read the slide, so I won't take the time to do that. As we go through the material, you'll see that there are some subdivisions that exist within these categories. When we talk about Indigenous people, we might talk about status and non-status Indians. And this relates to people's relationship to the Indian Act. We might talk about reserve, on reserve, or off reserve, or on reserve and off reserve, Aboriginal or Native people. And so again, this speaks to the location where the person usually lives. So some people may elect to stay on reserves, others might move to other places, leaving the reserve, but not abandoning their membership to the reserve community. I'm going to move forward with the next slide and ask you to take a deeper look at these definitions and to potentially look up a little bit of additional information beyond the text if you're interested. Indigenous people in Canada are a growing population. Indigenous folks are having more kids, they're having larger families, and so the birth rate is higher among Indigenous people than it is among white settlers. This increase in population, which is a steady phenomenon, is something that means we need to pay more attention to Indigenous people in Canada. We've always needed to pay attention, but we haven't always been bothered. Social workers, psychologists, sociologists, other caregiving and helping professions often encounter Indigenous people in their work. We'll talk a little bit more about why as we move through the slides. We know that if we move from the East Coast to the West Coast, there are more Indigenous people living further West. Some people argue this has to do with the time of settlement and who got where when. But again, this would be an area for another course and something that you might want to look, look up yourself. We know as well that Indigenous people tend to be younger than white folks, and so within the Indigenous population in Canada, we have a young, vital, and growing community. I mentioned in the previous slide that helping professionals often encounter Aboriginal people or Indigenous people in their work. And we see that this really reflects some challenges facing Indigenous communities, like lower levels of income, remarkably high levels of unemployment, and poor school completion rates, all factors that contribute to Indigenous people's use of social welfare services. Indigenous people who leave reserve and come to the city 
do so for many reasons. Many of the same reasons that a lot of us move from a smaller community to a larger community. A little more excitement, maybe a dream you want to follow, maybe someone you want to follow, maybe education that you want to undertake, or a job that you want to find. We know that Indigenous people living in urban communities face some unique challenges. Many of these challenges relate to negative stereotypes or assumptions that are made about Indigenous people. There are lots of stereotypes about Indigenous people being lazy, having addictions, or being work-averse. Factors that are applied to other community members who are understood as poor within Canadian society. But Indigenous people also face the myths and stereotypes that were assigned to their communities by government officials as part of a project of cultural genocide, something we'll talk about in a little while. There's a lot of complexity facing Indigenous people. A lot of complicated processes working together to produce the lived experience of being Indigenous. We know that when the British came to Canada to colonize the country, and to a lesser degree the French, but the French were a little bit more collaborative in their approach, there were treaty rights that were assigned to Indigenous people when they negotiated with the British. In many cases, these treaty rights have largely been ignored, or they've been adhered to only to be convenient to government. The federal government has a significant amount of control over the lives of Indigenous people, control that was established through the Indian Act of 1876. I talked a few minutes ago about the use of social welfare programs by Indigenous people, and I think it's worthwhile to say that, while this is absolutely true, we also know that the federal government is largely responsible for administering programs and services to Indigenous people who live on reserve. They also play a role in services provided to Indigenous people off-reserve. And so this kind of centralized uh, system also affects the kinds of resources and supports that Indigenous people can access. The reserve system in and of itself poses some significant challenges for Indigenous people, as reserves are often located on land that is substandard, swampy, rocky, hilly, meaning it's difficult for Indigenous people to engage in any kind of practice of working with the land. Work that would have traditionally been a part of their model of living. Then we have the residential school system, and you'll see that there are some supplemental materials online to support this. I'm hoping people have heard quite a bit about it, and I'm going to ask you to use those resources in order to develop a greater understanding. And finally, Aboriginal self-governance or self-government is one of the tools that are seen to potentially eliminate the current situation of oppression facing Indigenous people. Treaty rights, sometimes described as land claims, have been in the news a lot lately, and they of course have a very long history in a Canadian context. Disputes over treaty rights or lands held by Aboriginal people, in contrast to lands held by white settlers, have continued to be an area where Indigenous people are asserting their rights. The government has not done a very good job of respecting the treaties and respecting the locations or limitations on land use established within those treaties. As a result, there have been a number of conflicts and protests that have resulted. I live in Hamilton some of the time, and I'm sure some of you have heard of the Caledonia protests, in which members of the Six Nations 
have engaged in protests to try and prevent builders from building houses on land that is understood to belong to the Six Nations. Because the land settlement because the land treaties and settlements have not been completed in regard to this land, it becomes a matter of dispute between the federal government and the members of the Six Nation community. This is just one example, but there are hundreds of other examples that you might find all across the country. If you want to find out more about land claim settlements and land claim issues, you can Google it and you'll find a number of websites that relate to this topic and provide you with more detailed information. Hick describes the Indian Act of 1860, sorry, 1876 as legislation with a broad scope. We might understand this as sort of the omnibus bill of 1876. It's been changed a few times and some serious harms eliminated, like, for example, the idea that a woman who married a white man would lose her status. That's been eliminated from the Indian Act, and, there's, and the status of women who could prove that they lost their status because of these kinds of familial and marital relationships have had their status re, re, reinstated. However, there are still a lot of places where the federal government has a significant amount of control over Indigenous people because of this Act. I hope that you take some time to look through the chapter and look at some of the details, and perhaps to take an Indigenous Studies course to find out more about the specifics of the Indian Act. But it defines identity. It changes, alters, or measures identity for Indigenous people, describing who can understand themselves as an Indigenous person or as an Indian, and who is excluded from that identity because of certain phenomena. For example, as I just mentioned, a woman who would have married a man prior to about the mid-1990s. The Indian Act is definitely a process of control. It was designed to eradicate First Nations culture and to force assimilation on First Nations communities. It's very unpopular, and there is a lot of call for changes or elimination to the Act, introducing new possibilities for self-governance among Indigenous people in Canada. If you've been paying attention to media at all in the last two months, you'll know that there's been quite a bit of talk about the residential school system. In theory, residential schools were created to provide education and training to Indigenous children in Canada. It was something that went along with the reserve system. But the government elected to use the residential schools as a process of social control and as a vehicle for cultural assimilation. Residential schools prohibited the use of indigenous language and traditions, punishing students severely if they used either their own language or engaged in any non-sanctioned indigenous activity, like a ritual or other kind of custom. Many people who attended residential schools report and reported and report severe punishment and abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, and sexual assault. The level of abuse and harm experienced by Indigenous people, the level of conflict between white settler society and Indigenous communities, and the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in statistics that suggest they experience significant social harm are all good reasons to take a closer look at what is happening with Indigenous people. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal People was an extensive investigation into First Peoples' experiences, First Peoples' culture, and First Peoples' in epistemology or way of knowing about the world.
If you get a chance to have a look at some of the short videos that are available on YouTube about the Royal Commission, I'd really recommend it. It's quite an interesting thing to spend a few minutes considering. The Truth and Reconciliation Committee has looked in, in great depth into people's experiences within the residential school system towards a process of healing. It's hoped that if people are able to heal from past abuse, that they may be able to avoid the overrepresentation in negative uh, stereotypes and phenomena like, for example, unemployment or addictions. Finally, in many cases, the level of abuse and harm perpetrated through the residential school system has left people who are the survivors of that system with a lot of emotional, psychological, and social harm. As a result, monetary compensation has been paid to the survivors of the residential school system or is in the process of being paid in some circumstances. And this is seen as another step in the process of remediating the harms perpetrated by the Canadian government on First Peoples. The residential school system was part of a larger colonial project. This project was started by the British and then refined and maintained by the Canadian government. The residential schools were often described as a form of protection for Indigenous people. Because the Canadian government, the federal government, had control over Indigenous people, they could control the representations and knowledge about these people that were held by the majority or mainstream of Canadians. They also controlled, of course, the actual lived experiences of Indigenous people living on reserves. And they controlled as well the, the conditions under which Indigenous people could leave reserve and still maintain their status as Indigenous people. The residential school system was often described as a form of protection. Of course, one has to protect children from something if we're going to remove them from the home. And so representations or understandings of Indigenous people were often framed around problematic behaviours, such as alcoholism or greed, or what the Canadian government described as prostitution which may or may not, in fact, have been sex work. Assimilation was one of the hidden curriculums of the residential school system. There's a famous quote, which you may look up, because I don't know the source of the quote, that describes, maybe I'll look for it and post it on Blackboard, but it, de it describes the residential school system as a form of civilization. So the point of sending people to school where they could learn particular skills, where they could learn um, particular literacies, where they could learn to be more white, was really about killing the Indian to preserve the man. It's a very problematic understanding but it is something that shaped almost all of the Canadian policy towards Indigenous people. The idea of assimilation, of eliminating the traditions, language, knowledge, and practices of Indigenous people in favour of white colonial identities. Many of the rights that we take for granted as Canadian citizens and permanent residents in Canada were not afforded to Indigenous peoples. For example, voting rights, or the right to own land, or the right to move freely on and off reserve. So the level of control over Indigenous people was significant, and many of these controls remain in place even today. The limitations, restrictions, and lack of rights experienced by Indigenous people meant 
that there were little there were few opportunities to make a living to engage in work for wages or to engage in entrepreneurial behaviors so the federal government was largely responsible for providing income support programs to indigenous populations the government may understand this as a burden but other scholars suggest it's a problem that the Canadian government created and the low income levels paid to Indigenous people through income replacement programs was a part of the process of control used by the federal government. Poverty is an excellent way to keep people compliant. It's hard to storm the boardroom or the legislature with an empty stomach. Many of the perspectives or values and beliefs that were common within the British poor law were applied to Indigenous people. So the reserve system was really seen as a replacement for the kinds of poor houses and alms, alms houses that were common in Britain and in Canada in the early days of social welfare. We talked about income replacement or income support programs in the previous slide. In many cases, these systems were referred to as rations. So rather than providing uh, Indigenous people with monetary support, the government provided Indigenous people with actual goods and products, flour, butter, oil, meat. The Indigenous people were considered to be undeserving within this frame, as they were understood to be in many ways refusing to assimilate, which is why they were requiring the kinds of supports provided by the federal government. Early relief programs were only provided to people who were understood as status Indians. So people who were not registered as Indians under the Indian Act did not receive income support programs or relief programs from government. It's really important to think about the complexities of the Indian Act, which we're kind of glossing over in this discussion. There will be a course within the social work program on Indigenous peoples and social work. But I encourage folks to th think about taking some courses in Indigenous studies. It's important to understand the policy, the political, and the colonial elements that are wrapped up in this whole process. And if you're hoping to work in the helping professions as a social worker, as a psychologist, or as a sociologist, or some other configuration of helping, the lasting impacts of colonialism and the design of programs that were to support, and I'm using air quotes when I say support here, Indigenous people in Canada continue to affect people's lives. And so as helpers, we see these effects when we work with people in the field. The federal government's understanding of Indigenous identities, and I'm using the plural identities here, shapes the way in which social welfare benefits may be accessed by Indigenous people. Changes have occurred in terms of access, but there are still areas where access is restricted. The federal government still maintains a significant amount of control over Indigenous people. And access to services is often something that is specially negotiated between the federal government and the provinces. The exclusion being the areas where the federal government has both jurisdiction and is responsible for the provision of service. So for example, around the income support programs that Hick has outlined in this slide. Again, it's a very complex arrangement and a complex set of interactions. So I would strongly suggest that, again, you think about taking an Indigenous Studies course to learn more about these policies, policy realities. We'll also cover some of this in the Social Policy course.
and in the Indigenous Social Work course. Greater self-governance remains an important element in improving the lived experience of Indigenous people and improving their level of social welfare. The colonizing effects of Canadian federal government policy and the residential school system has caused harm to Indigenous people and Aboriginal self-governance or self-government is seen as a way of restoring and improving those realities. There are a few more slides in the slide deck outlining things like the Royal Commission and other policy-related activities that have happened, and I've elected to leave them out of this presentation. I feel like there's enough information in the slides that I've shown to give you an overview and that it's important for you to read the information about those particular projects that were undertaken in order to improve the lives of Indigenous people in Canada and to change Canadian attitudes and Canadian policies towards Indigenous people. I think you need to read those for yourself and decide what they mean for you. I certainly have enjoyed presenting this material to you, although I find it a little bit intimidating because it feels a bit like I'm perpetrating the same kind of uh, colonial practices as the federal government in a tiny way by talking about this as someone who doesn't belong to the Indigenous community. So I'd ask you to take that into account when you're thinking about the things that I've said. I've included some other materials relating to Idle No More on the Blackboard site and there are certainly many websites that you could elect to seek out yourselves in order to find out more. As a social worker or a psychologist or a sociologist, you have a responsibility to educate yourself about this issue and not to simply take my word for granted.